All right, so hello, museum families, and welcome to RBCM at Home Kids, a play date through screens across British Columbia and the world. The previous sessions are recorded, and you can find them on our Royal BC Museum YouTube page. My name is Chris O'Connor, and I'm a learning program developer at the Royal BC Museum. The museum and my home is on the territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, the Songhees and Esquimalt nations here in Victoria on Vancouver Island. I'm an uninvited guest on this territory and grateful to live, learn, and raise a family on this land. So this week we would have been starting in on our spring break camps. Camps are a really important part of what we do here at the museum and we really miss all the kids uh, that take part in our camps. Um, but we're happy to have RBCM at home kids and super excited today to have Royal BC Museum volunteer and classroom educator, Colin Stepney, and the librarian and historian from the BC Aviation Museum, Doug Rollins, both here today. So the theme today is airplanes and aviation. And without further ado, welcome Colin and Doug. Glad to be here. Hi everybody. So I'm Colin, um, I'm a volunteer at the uh, Royal BC Museum. I'm also a teacher. And today we're gonna be looking at some planes flying and how things move through the air and how we can make something that moves through the air. Before we jump into that, um, I just want to give a quick intro to what we're doing. So flying is really important to BC's history. Um, a lot of communities rely on flying these days. Uh, a lot of communities have through history, especially rural and indigenous communities along the coast. Um, so it's, it's very important for us to have an understanding of aviation. And to start that off today, we're going to learn some very basics of aerodynamics um, through looking at how aviation evolved in British Columbia and in the world, and then making something of our own that's gonna fly. So we're gonna head over to the uh, British Columbia Aviation Museum, which is up at Victoria International Airport in Sydney. And we're gonna join Doug Rollins. He's the librarian up at the British Columbia Aviation Museum to get us started with our first flying thing. Welcome to the BC Aviation Museum. So uh, we're right here in the main hangar and there's four aircraft that we want to show you. And we're gonna look at how we moved from a dream of flight to making flight a reality. So you'll see the progression as the technology advanced. Now our first aircraft, well, I should talk about flight itself. You need four elements uh, to an, make an aircraft successful. The first thing to consider is weight. You need something that's light but strong. The second thing is the wing. You need a way of generating lift. So we'll look at wings themselves. You need power. You have to have a way of moving the vehicle through the air. And so you need power to do that. And lastly, and probably most importantly, once you're in the air, you need control. You gotta be able to point that aircraft and move that aircraft where and when and how you want it. If you want it to climb, if you want it to descend or turn, that's also very important. So we're, the first aircraft we're gonna look at is way up on the ceiling. And uh, this was an idea, it's a dream of Leonardo da Vinci, who was an Italian experimenter uh, who thought about flight and thought, how do we build a machine where you could actually fly? And so that's the machine and it's very, very bird-like. And the reason it's very bird-like is because it's a special kind of a machine called an ornithopter and an ornithopter flaps its wings like this. So that was his idea uh, to have flapping wings. We'll get the thing off the ground. It's very bird-like because that's the only thing that he knew that flew. The only problem is that's not an efficient way to do it and humans aren't strong enough. The machine is too heavy, so it didn't actually fly, but it is the dream and we'll later see how that was realized. Back to you, Colin. All right, so, um, so for this right now, um, I'm gonna go down onto my tabletop here and we're going to start with, uh, we're gonna start with two things. You're gonna need something that's heavy, so I have, my Play-Doh, it's not super heavy, but we'll see why it's, it's considered heavy. And I'm also gonna have this roll of tape just to compare things. I'm also gonna grab something light and this is where your scrap paper might come in handy. So I have some scrap paper here. Now, Doug mentioned that you want a plane to be light. 
And that's because planes rely on air to stay up in the air. They rely on the atmosphere around them. If something is small and heavy, like that ornithopter, it's made out of wood, which is a very heavy material, and it's a lot of wood in that ornithopter, it's not going to be able to stay in the air easily. Air gets in the way of things, and if something's really heavy, the air can't get in the way of it very well. So I'm going to pick up my heavy thing here. This is my Play-Doh, and I'm going to drop it. And as you would expect, it falls very quickly. You can oh, do that is. too. Pick up your object and give it a drop. I'm going to drop my tape now. Again, it falls very quickly, as would be expected. Again, we're going to drop something else now. It's time for our scrap paper. Now, I don't know where this is going to go, but I'm going to drop it. It drops lightly. It drops, qu uh, drops slowly. And that's because the scrap of paper here is quite light, but it's also quite big. So Leonardo da Vinci had one thing right, and that's that we need wings. We need a big area, a big space, like this piece of paper, which you can drop to see. But you also need it to be light, because even if I make this Play-Doh nice and big, it's still going to fall with a thud quickly. Now, the reason I want you to have some scrap paper is because we do need this to be big, like Leonardo da Vinci's wings, or the wings that we're going to see later. We're going to make it small now, and how do you make paper small? You crumple it up. And go ahead and drop that, and you'll notice it falls a lot faster, a lot more like the Play-Doh. So you want planes to be light, and you want them to be made out of light materials and to have big wings. So Leonardo da Vinci's dream probably didn't quite come true, um, but we're going to go back to Doug to see the next step in the evolution of flight. So back to the British Columbia Aviation Museum. You're currently muted right now, Doug. Yeah, Doug, if you just, um, if you could unmute yourself. There you go. Okay, so sorry about that. Uh, so we're going to move ahead about 400 years, and it's now 1897. And we have a, a, an American inventor by the name of Octave Chanute, and he solves the weight problem. Uh, and we'll see that he also solves the uh, 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 wing issue. Uh, through his glider. It has no engine, it has no controls, but it's right behind me. And you can see that it's built of lightweight wood, very little wood, it's also fabric. Uh, and uh, what he would do was hang from that middle section on the lower wing, and he would jump from a hill, and he would guide that by shifting his body, uh, but he, created lift, he could sail through the air. So we got a few problems, we need power, we need control, but at least we have width, the wing and the weight that will do that. Back to you. All right. So for this here, we're going to take a look at those wings. Um, but as Doug mentioned, we don't have great controls on that. So that plane, it's not really a plane, it's a glider as Doug mentioned, um, it exactly. flies well but it doesn't go the direction that you want it to very easily. So we're gonna make our first paper airplane today. So we're gonna head down to the tabletop now. And before we start making, I'm just gonna show you what our goal is. It's a very simple classic paper airplane. Now this doesn't look anything like what Doug showed us before, but it's going to illustrate, it's going to demonstrate, and we're going to experiment using this particular shape of plane. So you're gonna to wanna to get your piece of paper out. You're gonna want it this direction so that it's facing well. up in front of you. So you'll want a piece of white paper or whatever color. You can use construction paper. Uh, it can be any size, any color, but you'll need to follow the instructions. Our first step is going to be to fold the paper across. Some people say it's hot dog. I'm just gonna say that we're making the paper skinnier. And once you've folded it, you wanna make sure the edges are lined up nicely. We're going to push that down so that we don't have a bump. It's just a nice flat fold. So now we have a skinnier paper. Now we're going to open up the paper, just like a book, it's open in front of us. And we're gonna go up to our top corners. And the first top corner, we're gonna bring right down to the middle, but we don't wanna fold it past the middle. We wanna fold it right down to the middle. Now, some of you may know how to make paper airplanes already. So if you're doing that, excellent. Um, for those of you that are learning, just keep following along. We're going up to the next corner. Same thing as this side. We don't wanna go past the middle. We want to bring it down to the middle. And if it's not quite perfect, don't worry. 
We do want a plane to be symmetrical. That means it's the same on both sides, but it doesn't have to be absolutely perfect because this is a paper airplane. Okay, so now we have this nice arrow shape. It's pointing in that way. That's going to be the front. Now we're going to make the wings because we've got the pointy front of our plane. We are going to take this corner here. And this is where it gets a little bit tricky because this corner needs to come to the middle of the plane. We're going to bring that in, but we're going to fold it carefully. So just like before, we don't want to bring it past the middle. We want to bring it to the middle, put it down the middle, and flatten, flatten it out. So again, I've made sure that I've lined up that corner right with the middle of our paper. And then I'm going to flatten it out. And just like all my other folds, I want to make sure that my fold is nice and flat. I'll demonstrate one more time on this side. Corner here, we're going to take that point and we're going to bring it right to the middle. And it should line up with this other point here as well. So I'm going to take that. And I'm going to try to line it up. And my plane probably won't be quite perfect. We're just going to have to see what happens here. You'll see that I lined it up right with the middle. So we have a nice pointed shape now. You're starting to see that plane take shape. Now we're going to fold it the other way. So what I did here is remember before we opened the book this way, but now we're going to fold the book around backwards. So instead of closing the book, we're going to open it even further and fold it around backwards and flatten out all the folds just like before. Run your finger over them to flatten them out so they're nice and sharp. And then now we get to make the wings. And this is where you get a bit of a decision to make. So for my wings, I like having nice big wings. The bigger the wings, the more the lift. And the lift is the thing that keeps you up in the air, so we want lots of it. So it doesn't matter about keeping things symmetrical or the same on both sides now because we only have to do one at a time. So do our first wing. And you'll notice this wing hasn't been done yet. You can start seeing our plane taking shape here. Now we're going to, now that I've folded one wing down to that side, we're going to turn it over so that we're looking. I'm going to keep the point facing up so that everyone's in the same place. Now we're going to take our other wing. And we want to keep this wing. Now this is where the symmetry becomes important, keeping things the same on both sides. We want to line up the front of this wing with the front of this wing. So I'm going to line that up. And I'm going to flatten down those folds so that it's nice and crisp, because you want a paper airplane to be strong, just like a real plane. And now we have a plane to experiment with. So to make this into our final plane. Colin, we just had a request to, um... Uh, to, if you can go back a couple steps. Yeah, just for show, sure. Maybe Absolutely. even just from the beginning, just to go through yeah. the steps again. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to start, I'm going to start from scratch one more time. One more time. So I have my paper in front of me, all side up. We're going to start by making the paper skinnier by folding it in half. So make your paper skinny, fold it in half. And then open it up like a book. And once you're open like a book, we're going to start in one of the corners. And this corner comes right to the middle. When we're building paper airplanes, things almost always come right to the middle. So we're going to bring this one down to the middle. And making sure that it stays at the middle, I'm going to put my finger on it so that it stays right at the middle. Now I'm going to flatten out that fold. And I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. Corner, down to the middle, making sure it stays at the middle, putting my finger on it so it stays at the middle, and then flattening out that fold. So now it's about the shape of a house. And now we're going to take this is, this is the more complicated fold. So we're going to take this corner. And again, just like before, we're taking it down to the middle. We're going to fold it so that this line here lines up with our middle line. So corner in my fingers. We're going to fold it over. And you'll see these two lines go along the same route now. They follow the same line. So 
I've done one. And once again, corner out here. And we're going to bring that corner down to meet up with our other corner. Corner in my fingers, bring it over, and bring it down the middle. Again, I'm going to flatten out that fold. So the big thing to remember is that our corners always come right to the middle. Now you should have a nice pointed triangle. And then we're going to, remember, we're going to fold the book. It's like opening a book, but opening it too far. You're going to keep opening the book all the way backwards. So you can see the side of the paper airplane. And now we're going to fold down the wings. And the wings, this is somewhere where you have a bit of choice. You can decide how big your wings want to be. I'm going to make them pretty big. So I'm going to fold. I'm going to take the top of my wing. And this one's going to go straight across from here over to here, from here over to here. And then just like before, I'm going to flatten out the fold. And if your wing's a bit of a different shape, that's OK, because all paper airplanes are slightly different. And then I'm going to turn the plane over, keeping the nose pointing up. And I'm going to try to match this wing to this wing. So I take this end of the wing, and I want this side here to line up with the wing right over here. So bringing it over, I want to make sure that lines up. And it's not going to be perfect. There's no paper airplane is completely perfect. And you'll see the top of the wing here. You can see the other side of the plane poking through in the back. So we want that to be pretty much the same. And then flatten out the fold. So now we have a pretty, we have the basic paper airplane shape. We have the body of the plane. We have these wings. And it feels like it might fall open, and that's OK, because our goal is to have these wings available to us in the triangle, to have a nose out here, the front of the plane, and to have the flat tail of the plane. Hey, right, thanks, Colin. OK. So now what we're going to do for our experiment here is, well, I'm going to say you should probably give this a throw first to make sure it's airworthy. So I'm going to give this a good toss here. OK. Mine flew, great. Um, give yours a toss and come back. And in a few moments, I'm going to explain what our experiment is here. I, I just flew mine and it worked. So. Excellent, I'm glad to hear that, Chris. I hope that everyone else had a great first flight with their plane. Um, and you'll notice that on this plane here, I've flown this one a few times and it's got some wrinkles in the front. Don't worry about it, that's okay. It's gonna get a little more wrinkled today, that's for sure. So I'm going to grab one of my paper clips now. And as Doug explained with that glider, that glider didn't have controls. It didn't have a steering wheel. It didn't have what we call the ailerons or flaps or elevators or any of those fancy things. All this person did was they moved their body around to change where the weight was in the plane. So what we're going to do for our first flight is we're going to attach a paper clip to the front of the plane. So attach a paper clip to the front of your plane. And before you throw it, think back to how it flew last time. Did it fly in a straight line? Did it go up? Did it go down? And now give your new plane with the paper clip a toss and see what happens. Does it change? Does it go up? Does it go down? Maybe it starts turning now. And I'd love to see, maybe, um, maybe if you have the option of sending in a comment, I'd love to know if something changed about it. And once you've done that, of course, we can also try putting it on the back as well. So try putting it on the front and the back of the plane and see whether the paper airplane changes how it flies. Maybe one of them works better. I already tried this earlier and I found that putting it on the nose of the plane made it fly pretty well. But if I put it on the back of the plane, the plane went out of control. Too much weight in the back made it go out of control. And then finally, before we move on to our next plane, I'm going to ask you to try putting a paper clip 
on one wing of the plane. So this is like if that person who is flying the plane, they were sitting in the middle of the plane and they move all their weight out onto one side of the plane and they attached a paperclip to the wing of the plane, what would happen? Now, since the paperclip isn't super heavy, I'm actually gonna go a little more with the weight and I'm gonna attach one of my big clips onto the wing here and I'm gonna see what happens. So what happened with mine is my plane went in a straight line. It went in a straight line and it turned over to the side where the weight was and then fell, it spun out of the sky. So that's what happens when you have the weight off of the middle of the plane. That's called center of gravity. Now that's not a great way to control a plane as you probably noticed. So now we're gonna go back to the uh, British Columbia Aviation Museum. I'm going to keep sharing um, and we're gonna look at another strange looking plane. Now the one that we have on our screen now, this is called the Gibson Twin Plane. It doesn't look anything like a plane that we're used to. And as we walk under it, we will see that the wings are not the shape of the wing on our paper airplane and they aren't even the shape of the wings on any of the planes that you might have seen before at the airport or flying over your school or flying over your house. This is a pretty bizarre plane, but what we need to remember is this plane was built in the time before there wasn't a normal shape for planes. However, as we walk under, we're gonna pause and we're gonna look up and we see something there that's been added and that's an engine. So now we have an engine. So the Gibson twin plane is the first plane to be built completely in BC, although it wasn't completely successful. So William Gibson built this plane and on its first flight, unfortunately, it ran into a tree, but it was then rebuilt, it was fixed up, and they flew it successfully. So this was, it was a partially successful plane, but as you can tell, it doesn't look like a normal plane. So a lot of changes happened between that plane and modern planes. So for our final plane, we are going to- So, so when, uh, you're trying, when you're trying things out, sometimes you have to run into a tree or two, right? Absolutely. When you're trying things out, sometimes a tree or two can help. And in this case, the tree might have been avoidable. And this plane had some basic controls, but it didn't have quite all the controls that it might have needed. So we're going to take a look now at a plane that does have all the controls that we need. So we're going to head back to the BCAM and take a look at our last plane. And this one has a special feature. If we look down at the, at the bottom of this plane, on this plane is called a Hoffar the float plane. On the bottom of the plane, we have floats. And this plane is important because number one, this is the first successful, I could call it a normal looking plane. It's what we would expect a plane to look like in modern times. This is the first one to be completely built and designed in BC. It was made by a boat builder. And this boat builder didn't even know what planes were supposed to look like and how they moved through the air. And yet it was pretty successful. So float planes have been super important in BC because before airplanes were uh, common, we didn't have runways, which meant we had to use something big and flat. And the biggest, flattest thing we have around here is water. So um, uh, Jimmy Hoffer built this plane to take off and land on water. So moving back to my desktop, we are going to take a look at why that's important. So here on my plane, I have a little float plane here. It's a little different than the Hoffer, but we have floats on the bottom. Now this one has, two floats. The Hoffar only had one big float. This plane also, like the Hoffar, has controls. It has a way to move other than a person moving from one side of the plane or the other to make it turn back and forth. So back here, we have these things called elevators. That makes the plane go up and down. Here we have ailerons. On the bottom wing, we have ailerons. That makes the plane turn back and forth. So we're gonna grab our paper airplanes again and we're gonna do an experiment with uh, ailerons and elevators and we're gonna see what we can do. So grab that paper airplane and put it out in front of you. Now for this one, paper clips, we're gonna put the paper clips aside for now because we're gonna do stuff just with the paper airplane that's in front of us. So we wanna have control over this plane without putting a paper clip on it. We can't add anything to the plane, but we can change something about the plane. So what I'd like you to do is choose a wing. You can choose this wing or this wing, and you're gonna put a little fold just in the end of it, just a little fold. If we fold the whole wing, things might not work too well, but we're just gonna put a little fold at the end of one wing. It can be even just a little crumple. You can even crumple up the end of one wing. So we're changing the shape of this wing. And now once you've crumpled that, give it a toss. 
and see what happens. Which way did it turn? Did it go in the direction of that crumple? Did it start to spin maybe? I know my plane, when I did this earlier, I haven't thrown this one because I need it on my desk right now, but when I threw my plane earlier, it started spinning because I put too big of a fold. Try putting an even bigger fold in your wing now, an even bigger one. So I've put a pretty big one here. That's a, that is a very big fold. And try throwing it again. And you notice the more that we fold this wing, the less it's going to fly well. What happened that time? Now I'm going to flatten out that fold. I'm going to try to make the wing as good as new. Probably not going to be quite perfect. We're going to pretend this one hit a tree just like William Gibson's um, twin plane. Um, but we fixed this one up and it's going to get ready for its next flight. And our next experiment with making controls on the back of the wings is going to be to add a, the same fold to the back of each wing. So try to do two folds that are about the same on each wing. I've done mine up. You could do yours down, but try making them both the same. Make sure that they either both go up, one on each side, or down, one on each side. What happens? Now, if we have ours aimed up, mine are aimed up here, the nose of the plane is going to go up. And that's because if they're aimed up, the air is going, as the air rushes over the wing, the air is going to hit the back of the wing and push the plane up. Let's see if I can get that angle right for the camera. So as the, way, as the air rushes over the wing, it hits it and pushes the plane up. Now, if we put it down, I'm going to quickly adjust my plane. If you've already done one, do the opposite now. Try out the opposite one. So take the same size little folds. I've done mine down now, mine go down, see what happens. It's like a dive down. bomb. It dive bombed, uh-oh. So that's because if we're flying along like this and the air is rushing under the wing, it's going to hit that surface. We call these control surfaces anytime there's a little fold or a change in the wing. And it's gonna wanna go down because it's pulling, it's, it's kind of, the air is kind of pulling on that surface and pulling things down. And our last experiment, this one's kind of silly, um, but it does show how real planes work, is we're gonna have one of our surfaces going down and the other one going up. Now this should have some interesting results. Now you have, they're both different. One goes up, one goes down. Give it a toss and what happens? So it kind of spirals. This one, it's a bit like a screw and it just starts spinning through the air. And that's because one wing, one wing wants to go down and the other wing wants to go up. And when that happens, this wing wants to go up and it wants to keep going up and it wants to keep going up. And the other wing wants to go down and it wants to keep going down. And so things keep spinning. So when a plane turns, you see a plane turning in the sky, all that's doing is it has one of these down and one of these up. But the pilot knows not to keep them like that, so it just turns a bit, and then the pilot will straighten them back down. So that's how you can control your paper airplanes. Now, before we go today, um, we've learned a bit about how planes move. We've looked at some of our the history of our planes in British Columbia and around the world with Leonardo da Vinci's ornithopter, which is definitely not the kind of plane we're used to. We're going to take a look back at what the British Columbia Aviation Museum has to offer, and we're going to head back to Doug because he has something to share quickly before we go. Oh, we want to make sure that we're uh, unmuted. We've got a kids area. Unfortunately, it's uh, full of activities, especially for kids. It's closed right now, but when the health situation is over and we're hopeful and believe it'll be over within a few months, we'll have it open. I'm gonna give you a quick view of it so you've got an idea of what kids can do specifically in, in the Aviation Museum. So first, uh, right here is a bunch of controls uh, that you can push, pull, pry. There's a radio, there's all kinds of things try out. Right here is an instrument simulator. You can sit in there with the controls 
and you can have a look what real airplanes have and try them out. I've even got something special here. This is an aircraft carrier and right here is the aircraft. And you can sit there and you can actually try the controls and see with a little luck, you can land it on the, air, on the aircraft carrier. So that's pretty cool. We've got flight simulators right there. We've got a real airplane. You can sit in, you can try the controls and see how they move. More flight simulators there. There's pedal cars, there's a little Jeep, there's even a helicopter. So there's all kinds of stuff to see and to do for kids in the Aviation Museum. And thank you very much uh, for inviting us today. Hope you have a good time. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Doug. And thank you so much, Colin. Um, that was amazing just to see that that progression from an initial idea centuries ago to uh, where we are now uh, with planes um, and aviation and demonstrating, Colin, although the importance of trying things out and seeing how it works. And, and that's really, it seems like that was a really important part of designing planes is just trying things out and seeing what works and then adding to that, um, that knowledge. So um, thank you so much uh, to, the, to the two of you. Um, and like Doug was saying that um, the Avi BC Aviation Museum is, is at the uh, Victoria Airport or near the Victoria Airport um, and really worth checking out if you, um, if you can, can make it there. Um, so yeah, thank you so much everyone for joining. I did want to uh, add one thing is that um, one of our viewers um, sent this picture. So okay. um, I'm going to share, share my screen. So this is... Um, okay. So this is uh, Dana um, and her son Paul are joining in today. So Dana, um, uh, so Paul is named after uh, his great grandfather, Paul Fanning. He was in the Royal Canadian Air Force. He trained pilots for World War II at the Comox Air Force Base. And he also flew during the Cold War searching for wa waters for submarines. Um, and we have, uh, so she wanted to send this photo of um, the plane that he, he flew. Um, so I'm sharing it now. So thank you so much, Dana, for, um, for, uh, for letting us know about, about this. And, and it, thinking about all the sort of the history, the personal histories of planes and aviation um, with with lots of people throughout BC. So. For sure. And of course, aviation in BC, there are so many stories and so much history that half an hour cannot do justice. So thank you so much, Chris. Yeah. All right, so um, that is the end. Uh, we'll be, we'll, we just ended our 